accused of being one of the biggest drug smugglers of all time, is at this moment being sentenced in a Florida court. Described as the Marco Polo of the international drug trade, he's expected to receive a sentence of around 40 years imprisonment. American drug enforcement agents claim Marks from Kenvik Hill in Mid Glamorgan masterminded a $100 million conspiracy to import cannabis into the USA. Although he's pleading guilty, Marks has denied amassing a huge personal fortune and claims the case has left him penniless. As he stands in the dock this evening in Miami, Howard Marks is finally about to pay the penalty for a drug smuggling career that spanned 20 years. He shipped marijuana worth up to one billion pounds into the United States and Britain and led one of the world's biggest drug cartels. But Marx is now philosophical about a long future behind bars. I'm going to suffer tremendous amounts for the separation from my family. This is what bugs me 24 hours a day, not being able to see my wife, my children and my parents. Um, as far as any other aspect of prison life, um, it doesn't frighten me. Um, I'm able to survive here, okay, I'm able to read a lot, keep myself fit and healthy. So the day-to-day -day life doesn't worry me, worry me, but the separation from my family just tears me to shreds. With the aid of forged passports, the wily and flamboyant Oxford graduate always eluded the police and thought he was untouchable until the American Drug Enforcement Administration caught up with him at last in 1988. It was a friend, Lord Moynihan, half-brother of sports minister Colin Moynihan, who secretly recorded the incriminating conversations with Marx that trapped him. Marx's wife, Judy, later to be released, was arrested with him at their luxury villa in Mallorca before they were extradited to Florida. The US authorities were jubilant, although at the time Marx protested his innocence, claiming the trial would be, as he put it, the biggest bloody circus in the history of that idiotic country. Mr. Marx was sort of the, uh, the Marco Polo of the drug traffic. Uh, Mr. Marx is the one who really instituted, going back to 1973, a lot of the methods that we see traffickers doing today. I'm not quite sure what the Marco Polo of the drug business means. It's a bit like being Percy Thrall of philosophy. I have absolutely no idea what it means. However, Marx has since decided to come clean. Although he's likely to be sentenced to 40 years tonight, he's done a plea bargaining deal, which means that by admitting just two counts of racketeering, he could be released on parole after 10 years. I think it was a mixture of foolishness, a lack of understanding of the, the jurisdiction of, of American law in foreign countries, and of course financial greed. At home in Kenvik Hill today, Howard Marx's father was maintaining his rigid silence about his son's drug smuggling exploits. As the Marx legend has grown, his family have always refused to talk publicly about the son who's become the world's most famous drug runner. Though Marx himself has carefully cultivated an image as a valley's boy made bad, his was a comfortable middle-class background. His father is a retired sea captain. His uncle Mostyn, the local county councillor, awarded the MBE. From school in Kenfig Hill, Howard, an exceptionally bright youngster, won a scholarship to Oxford. It was the 60s, and it was there he acquired a taste for cannabis, the drug that would dominate his life. With the explosion of hippie drug culture, he found he could make thousands of pounds from first selling and then smuggling pot. After university, while other Oxford graduates settled down to respectable careers, Howard began peddling dope on an increasingly grand scale changing identities and addresses, and all the while showing two fingers to an establishment he so nearly joined. He's probably the last representative of the 60s. Uh, he had a low boredom threshold. I think the adrenaline was something that always excited him. And he made ever such a lot of money out of it. I don't think one should underestimate that. How much do you think he did make? Millions. Millions came, millions went. Uh, I should be surprised if he hasn't got some stashed away. But he was never the, the, the grasping sort. It was all part of that 60s world. You got in magic sums of money, and you then spent them on carousing. And it all seemed to be harmless. The victimless crime, that's what he used to go about saying, and beaming in that sort of charming Welsh way of his. On his frequent trips back to South Wales, he was a familiar face in the pubs of Porthcawl. Favourite haunt of the local hippies was the Knight's Arms. The then landlord remembers him as a popular character for whom no one had a bad word. Pot wasn't, wasn't a bad name then. And um, I knew he was mixed up in it, but he didn't look like your normal dealer, you know? Looked like a proper gentleman. And never had any trouble with him. You know what they like in Wales? They like to say about folk heroes. He seems to be some kind of folk hero. 
Howard, it seems, never forgot his origins. He claims once to have proposed a scheme to the Welsh office for exporting water to the Middle East in tankers. Naturally, the ships would return via the major drug-producing countries of the region. He thought cannabis was all right, and it was a wonderful way to make money. Uh, he didn't think the other drugs were all right, and he didn't deal in them. He's a specialist in the rather arcane trade of smuggling extremely large ton quantities of marijuana from A to B, for which there was an enormous demand and still is. As his smuggling career became established, Howard's Oxford connections led him into the shadowy world of MI6, for whom he claims to have briefly worked. It was a link he would ruthlessly exploit when he was eventually arrested and tried at the Old Bailey. He told the court he'd been working for the Secret Service. It was almost certainly a pack of lies, but the jury fell for it, and Howard left a free man. Moving to Mallorca, he could have retired into obscurity, but that wasn't Howard's style. Still an active dealer, he decided to publish his memoirs. I guess he wanted to be famous. He admits that he, he committed the most outrageous acts of perjury at his old Bailey trial a few years ago in this country, and persuaded the jury to believe him. Uh, and then afterwards cheerfully admits he's made it all up when he can't be tried again. Now, I suppose that's the kind of thing that gives policemen apoplexy. This time, though, the police on his tail were Americans. After stalking him on three continents, he was arrested in Mallorca and deported to the US. Howard Marks claims that after 20 years of drug smuggling, he's made little profit for himself. The family's small holding in the Swansea Valley has been sold to meet his legal costs, and wife Judy now claims she's no money to look after their children. So where has all the money gone? He was very foolish indeed to go back to dope smuggling after telling me all his trade secrets in the book that I wrote, which led everybody to come after him. So, I mean, anybody who could be as zany as to do that is maybe zany enough to spend all the money as well, I don't know. I have no asset whatsoever, unfortunately, absolutely none, which is very distressing, but nevertheless true.